Bonjour and bienvenue to the podcast you are currently listening to. Je m'appelle Ben Clark and I host the podcast Battle Royale, where my best friend Eliza and I pass judgment on all the kings and emperors of France from Clovis to Napoleon III. Those who we do not deem worthy will be sent to the guillotine. So subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And join us on our macabre adventure from the Dark Ages to the French Revolution and help us decide who's ahead and who's headless at Battle Royale French Monarchs. That's Battle Royale colon French Monarchs, wherever you get your podcasts. It was a cool November night, and the Duke of Orléans was riding through the streets of Paris with a handful of companions and servants. He had been spending the evening with Queen Isabeau, discussing the business of state. No doubt there were those who might see this late meeting as scandalous. After all, the Duke was a known philanderer. But with the king so often incapacitated, the Duke and Queen had to work closely together to keep the kingdom running, and to profit from that venture. And so, when Louis of Orléans received a summons from King Charles, he immediately bid farewell to the Queen and left to meet with his brother. The Duke began the short journey from the Queen's Hotel to the Hotel Saint-Paul. While his servants led his mule and held torches to light up the dark streets of medieval Paris, the Duke of Orléans was distracted. He was playing with his glove and humming a quiet melody to himself, while wondering why he had been summoned so late. Had his brother recovered from his most recent episode of madness? If so, he would have to make sure that his attempts to exclude the Duke of Burgundy from power wouldn't be undone in the name of reconciliation. But Charles had not sent the note to his brother. Rather, it was done on the orders of the Duke of Burgundy, and Louis of Orléans had fallen into his trap. All of a sudden, a group of a dozen or so men emerged from the shadows, brandishing bows, axes, and clubs. Thinking that he was about to be robbed and that his status would save him, Lou yelled, I am the Duke of Orléans! But he soon learned that this outcry had only sealed his fate when one of the men responded, Ah, and you are the one we are looking for, as his group encircled the Orléanist entourage. The rest of the men began shouting, Kill! Kill! and began to land blows on the Duke of Orléans and his party. The squires that tried to protect their master were quickly killed or knocked out, while the rest fled. The first blow to hit the duke knocked him off his mule, and while on the ground he cried, What is happening? in a mixture of fear, panic, and confusion. Those would be his last words, as moments later, his head was split open by one of the attacker's axes. As the attackers were making sure that Orléans was indeed dead, they were roused by a cry of murder coming from a nearby window. One of the men shouted back, Shut up, you damned woman! But it was too late, and the alarm had been raised. Another man, in a red hood, soon walked out of a nearby house. He examined the body, and then turned to the attackers, saying, Put out your torches. He's dead. Let's go. The murderers then mounted their horses and fled. One of them threw his torch into the house that the hooded man had emerged from, and began shouting, Fire! Fire! hoping to sow confusion and aid their escape. As the attackers fled, one of the Duke of Orléans' valets began to regain consciousness. He made his way over to his master, trying to rouse him, crying, Hello, my lord! But when it was clear that Orléans was gone, he began crying, Murder! Murder! and was soon joined by several others. The Duke of Orléans was dead, murdered in cold blood on the streets of Paris. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West. Episode 23, La Morte de Orléans. Last time, we covered the building tension between John the Fearless and his cousin Louis of Orléans. And if you can't tell from the title of this episode and the first few minutes of it, Louis of Orléans will not make it out of this episode alive. Before we get started, I'd like to echo the teaser from the beginning of this episode and urge you to check out the Battle Royale podcast. If you want to learn about French royal history from Clovis to Napoleon III, it's a great and entertaining resource. 
And, as of recording, they are currently on Charles V, so their next few episodes are sure to heavily feature the Dukes of Burgundy. By the way, I hope the return of the old intro music in this episode isn't too jarring, but I thought that the triumphant tone of Adelia didn't really fit here. Now, when we left off in mid-1406, the relationship between Burgundy and Orléans was not quite so fraught. While the dukes weren't friends by any means, and mere months ago they were on the verge of starting a civil war, a détente had been reached. John the Fearless had secured his place on the royal council, and had assured that his reform agenda would be considered, while Louis of Orléans maintained his dominance over that royal council in the aftermath of their brush with civil war. So while the immediate aims of both princes had been assured, the underlying tension between Orléans and Burgundy had not been resolved. But despite this, the two dukes put on a show of friendship. They wore each other's emblems in public, embraced each other as friends, and even shared in the lordship of the city of Pisa. The sharing of the lordship of Pisa is interesting in part due to how hard Philip fought to prevent Louis from becoming the lord of Genoa. But regardless, this partnership was short-lived, as Pisa was conquered by Florence not long after the city submitted to the dukes. And so, with the dukes getting along so well, a new campaign against English holdings in France was decided upon. The constable of France had spotted an opportunity to push the English out of Bordeaux, but to do so, he needed more men and money. John, ever the opponent of raising taxes, would need to be brought on board. But here he saw an opportunity to further his own interests in the north. Rumors were circulating about a possible English invasion of Picardy, so John put forward the idea of launching a simultaneous campaign against the Pale of Calais. So now Louis of Orléans would lead an expedition against Bordeaux, while John, as the Captain General of Picardy, would lead one against Calais. This dual expedition got the dukes working together, and John even accepted the need for a new tie to be raised. Still, though, John had made his acceptance of the tie conditional on its relative smallness, and had forced the royal council to supplement the funds for these twin campaigns by further cutting the salaries and grants to royal officials. However, this plan ran into a roadblock when the Parlement, staffed by those same royal officials, refused to register the edict. John had already left Paris for the north, and so without his presence in the capital, the royal council decided to increase the tie rather than fight the Parlement. The tax burden was more than doubled, with most of those funds going towards the southern expedition to Bordeaux. When the Duke of Burgundy learned of these changes to the plan, he rushed back to Paris to fight them, but he was too late. Tax farmers had already been dispatched, and the Duke of Orléans had already begun his march to Bordeaux. So although furious, John accepted this fait accompli and returned to his own martial preparations. Now technically, John's expedition wasn't supposed to be against Calais itself, but rather against Ballingham a French-held castle that the English were besieging. Once that was done, he was given the commission to do, quote, other things concerning the war and the defense of Picardy. John was able to quickly relieve Bollingham, and then got to the business of campaigning into the Pale of Calais. From how John's commission was worded, it seems like the king and royal council weren't set on taking the fight to Calais. Rather, they wanted to relieve Bollingham and reduce Calais' ability to stage an invasion of Picardy. However, John's aims seemed to be more ambitious. After driving the English away from Ballingham, the Duke of Burgundy set his sights on the English-held Castle of Guine in the Pale of Calais. Guine was an important cog in the English defensive line, and John might have been hoping that weakening that position would put him in a stronger negotiating position with respect to the Anglo-Flemish trade talks. Furthermore, while he was acting as a royal official, much like Louis of Orléans with regards to Bordeaux, John also likely hoped that if he led the conquest of the Pale of Calais, he would be granted control of it by the king. So John began building up his forces in Artois, just down the road from the English foothold. Calais was one of the most heavily fortified and best defended places in Europe at the time, and so a large and strong army would be needed to take it. The Duke of Burgundy gathered an army of over 10,000 men and the supplies necessary to put the fortresses of the Pale under siege, including 120 cannons and 12 tons of gunpowder, over 200 siege crossbows, and 25 trebuchets. John also did not skimp on the logistical front, as his preparations included gathering supplies from the surrounding areas and arranging for wagon trains and ships to ensure that his army remained fed and supplied, and even brought some portable flour mills with him. But days before John was set to begin his march into the Pale, 
he received orders from the royal council to cancel his campaign and dismiss his army. John protested these orders and even offered to supplement the cost of his expedition, but that was not enough to convince the royal council to give the go-ahead, and John was once again ordered, in no uncertain terms, to stand down. The Duke of Burgundy was quick to place the blame for this onto the Duke of Orléans, and that likely was true, if only indirectly. The fact of the matter is that despite the personal element of the court politics, the reason for the expedition in the first place was English weakness in Guienne rather than in Calais. John had accomplished the goal set for him while Louis still needed more men and supplies, and John's army was a huge drain on the treasury. In the end, the Duke of Orléans also had to call off his campaign due to lack of funds, and the lack of success from both campaigns once again worsened the relationship between the dukes. John returned to Paris in a huff, and took out some of his frustration by dressing down the Duke of Anjou, who had prevented the tie for Calais from being collected in his territories, contributing to John's money troubles. John later claimed that he never got his portion of the tie, and that it had all been passed south to the Duke of Orléans. But there wouldn't be a confrontation between Orléans and Burgundy, because shortly before the Duke of Orléans returned to Paris from Guienne, John returned to Flanders to oversee another round of Anglo-Flemish trade negotiations. John's participation in a campaign against Calais might have angered the English, but they were willing to accept his dual roles as the Count of Flanders and the Captain General of Picardy and Flanders, so negotiations continued. While Louis of Orléans was in Paris and John the Fearless was in Flanders, the former took the opportunity of the latter's absence to further isolate him. The Duke of Orléans, taking up John's banner of reform, pushed for the number of members of the royal council to be reduced from 51 to 26. While in the abstract, this move should have been supported by John as a way to reduce the large salaries paid towards the councillors, the devil was in the details. Many of the cut members were either Burgundians or sympathetic to John, and out of the remaining 26 members of the council, there were only two that could be considered allies of the Duke of Burgundy. These changes essentially eliminated John's ability to assert his will in Paris, and he found that the payments from the French treasury that had been promised to him months ago were not coming. In April of 1407, the Duke of Burgundy even sent a letter protesting this non-payment to Paris, where he outlined the crown's debt to Burgundy, which ended up totaling almost 350,000 francs. Even specific subsidies, earmarked for coastal defense against the English, were withheld. John had also been granted the right to proceeds from certain royal taxes in his territories, but this revenue stream still ended up going to Paris, and then, inevitably, to Orléans. This massive amount of lost revenue was a real threat to Burgundy. Philip the Bold had built his realm using French revenues, and his son still required them to remain solvent. For now, he could still wrangle money from the wealthy towns of Flanders and Italian bankers such as the Rapondi to weather the storm, but if he couldn't reopen the tap from the French treasury, some serious financial reforms would be needed to be made in the Burgundian domains. And those domains were also under threat from the Duke of Orléans. Louis was not making direct attacks on Burgundy, Flanders, or Artois, but he was working to isolate and surround John's lands. Louis's alliance with the Duke of Helder's Ulic, the Count of Saint-Paul, the Dukes of Lorraine and Bar, and other imperial princes in the Low Countries and Upper Rhine region threatened John with encirclement. An encirclement soon moved to encroachment, as in late 1406, Joan of Brabant died, making John's brother Anthony the new duke. Louis, as the Duke of Luxembourg, took that opportunity to claim a number of castles on the Luxembourg-Brabant border. Furthermore, John's brother-in-law, John of Bavaria, the prince-bishop-elect of Liège, was currently in a conflict with the city of Liège. This conflict will escalate over the course of 1407, and I will cover it in more detail next time. But for now, just know that Louis of Orléans was an ally of the city of Liège, and was working to get Charles VI to intervene against John of Bavaria. And while John the Fearless was negotiating the Anglo-Flemish Treaty of Neutrality, Louis was urging the Admiral of France, who is one of his clients, to attack English shipping in Flemish waters, throwing a significant spanner in these negotiations. So with the Duke of Orléans blocking John's access to political influence and French money, and threatening to encircle the Burgundian domains, the Duke of Burgundy resolved to take drastic steps. 
It seems that John the Fearless had first resolved to kill his cousin Orléans in the summer, shortly after the purge of the royal council, but for whatever reason he decided against it, probably hoping that the two could come to another power-sharing arrangement. But John the Fearless was out of luck in that regard, as the next time he was in Paris, the following September, he was totally isolated. The two cousins squabbled on many fronts, but Orléans always ended up victorious. So seemingly without any other options, the Duke of Burgundy turned to violence. Many histories of this event like to assert that John was motivated by revenge because Orléans had seduced his wife. It's definitely possible that this is true, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence of this happening, and I find it perfectly likely that John's decision to kill Louis was purely motivated by financial and political considerations, as well as an intense personal dislike from the years of rivalry between Burgundy and Orléans. So with John's mind made up, he set about making arrangements for the murder, and to make sure that he would not be blamed for it. Shortly before the dirty deed was done, John had made a very public reconciliation with Louis, even sharing a drink with him the night before, and making plans to share dinner days after. The Duke of Burgundy, through a proxy, rented a house on the Rue Vieille du Temple, the street which led from the Queen's main palace to the royal residence, the Hôtel Saint-Paul. He hired a group of knights who were either short on money, had a vendetta against the Duke of Orléans, or both, and bribed a royal officer to lure the Duke of Orléans out to the street at night. With everything in place, the Duke of Orléans rode out on the night of November 23, 1407, to meet his brother, but instead was met by John's hired goons and struck down in the street. John maintained his facade of innocence in the days after the murder, even helping to escort Louis's coffin during the funeral procession and faking tears and lamentations all the way. And initially, suspicion did not fall on John at all. The original prime suspect was a man named Hubert de Chauny. De Chauny's wife was seduced by Orléans and had a son with the Duke. There's even a story, which is featured in a painting by Eugène de la Croix, where Orléans invited de Chauny over to inspect the beauty of one of his lovers. However, that lover was de Chauny's wife, with her face obscured by a bedsheet. But regardless, Hubert de Chauny was out of Paris when the Duke of Orléans was murdered, and had been for a long time, so the investigation had to continue. The gates of the city were locked, and soon the provost of Paris announced that he would search the residences of the royal councillors and princes. John heard the news while he was at a gathering of the princes at the Duke of Berry's Hôtel de Nel. His face must have revealed his involvement, as the Duke of Anjou quickly pulled John and the Duke of Berry aside to ask if the Duke of Burgundy was involved with the assassination. Possibly caught off guard, or simply not wanting to keep quiet anymore, John promptly confessed, saying that he was inspired to do so by the devil. Anjou was stunned, and Berry began to weep. John the Fearless then left in a rush. He even passed the Duke of Bourbon on his way out. When Bourbon asked why he was in such a rush, John simply replied that he needed to use the bathroom. The next day, John made his way back to the Duke of Berry's Hôtel de Nel for another meeting of the royal princes, but this time he was turned away at the door. Perhaps worrying that he was not protected from punishment as a prince of the fleur-de-lis, John returned home, his head full of anxiety. Upon returning to the Hôtel d'Artois, John decided to flee the capital. He gathered a few companions and horses and rode hard for the county of Artois, covering the almost hundred miles from Paris to the edge of the county in a single day. And it's a good thing that he rushed out, because he was soon pursued by a small force led by the Admiral of France, one of the late Duke of Orléans' allies, once he heard of John's involvement and flight. But John had too much of a head start and made it back to Artois safely. However, while John was safe in Artois, he was also now isolated from the court. So shortly after the Duke of Burgundy left Paris, the Duchess of Orléans returned to the city. Valentina Visconti had been virtually exiled from the capital for over a decade, but after the murder of her husband and the flight of the perpetrator, she judged that the time was right to make a return. The Duchess of Orléans and her young children petitioned the king to bring the Duke of Burgundy to justice, but in this time of crisis, the government of France was essentially unhelmed. With the king mad, Louis of Orléans dead, and John away from Paris, there was no true leader to take charge. Richard Vaughan writes that the princes, quote, who formed the French government and represented the French king, proved utterly incapable of dealing with the crisis. The assassination of the brother of the king by the Duke of Burgundy shattered and demoralized them. 
Instead of uniting, it divided them. While the shock paralyzed them, the knowledge that there was considerable public support for John's deed prolonged and deepened their inaction. The Dukes of Berry and Anjou, who now controlled the French court, were loath to spark a civil war, and so while Valentina Visconti demanded harsh justice, they took a lighter approach and entered into negotiations with the Burgundian officers who remained in Paris. Although, as a consolation, the Duchess of Orléans did manage to get John officially excluded from the French government and removed his guardianship of the Dauphin in the event of the king's death. When John the Fearless saw that there would be no army coming to seize him and that there was little drive in Paris to punish him, he knew that he had an opportunity to swing things in his favor. John decided to go on the PR offensive and rather than asking for a pardon, began to lay out the justification of his deed. John's PR offensive would be on full display about two months after the assassination, when he and the other French princes met in Amiens to work out a reconciliation. In that time, while the dukes in Paris were paralyzed with indecision, John the Fearless was working to affirm his alliances and secure his territories. John spent his time meeting with the four members of Flanders, the estates of Flanders, his brothers, the Duke of Brabant and the Count of Nevers, his brothers-in-law, the Count of Hainaut, Holland, Zeeland, and the Prince Bishop of Liège, and his own ducal officers. To his subjects, he began working on his initial justifications. He claimed that the Duke of Orléans was planning to murder him, and so he acted in self-defense, that Louis and Valentina were responsible for the king's madness and had even been plotting to poison Charles, that Orléans was a tyrant and needed to be stopped. The people of Flanders were willing to believe John's account, and importantly, so were the people of Paris, who were receiving propagandistic dispatches from him. So with the Amiens conference coming up, John was ready to dominate the proceedings. The conference was set to begin on the 20th of January, but John had arrived in the city a week prior. Amiens was outside of John's territory, but the city was an industrial center not dissimilar from the towns of Flanders and Artois. Furthermore, the city was a big fan of John's reform agenda, and so the Duke of Burgundy was quite popular with the people of the town. The Dukes of Berry and Anjou arrived in Amiens to see John already at home in the town. The chronicler Angouran de Monstrelet claims that John brought a small army of around 3,000 men with him to Amiens, but it is far more likely that the Duke had a smaller force of a few hundred. Regardless, John signaled his willingness to commit to either peace or war in symbolism. The door to his hotel was decorated with his personal emblem, a carpenter's plane, and two lances on either side, a sharp war lance on one and a blunt jousting lance on the other. But in Amiens, John and the dukes were at loggerheads. The big goal of the dukes of Berry and Anjou was to come to an agreement with John where he displayed remorse and would officially seek a royal pardon for the deed. This would allow the crown to save face and allow for a reconciliation between Burgundy and the lingering Orleanists. John, however, took a different route. Rather than show regret for the murder and seek a pardon, John decided to justify the assassination of Louis. John did so directly to the other dukes, but in his party was a theologian from the University of Paris, Jean Petit, who was preparing a more in-depth and rigorous version of the justification. And so, with John refusing to seek a pardon, the Amiens conference broke down. The Duke of Burgundy resolved to present his justification to the king, while the Dukes of Berry and Anjou told him to stay out of Paris. But as we've seen, Berry and Anjou did not have the political will to keep Burgundy out of the capital. When the conference ended, John returned to Artois and once again began to call for soldiers. Soon, the Duke of Burgundy once more marched to Paris in arms. Paris was a mess. The king was still mad. The princes of the blood were either unwilling or unable to take decisive action, and the Duchess of Orléans, fearing for her safety, albeit more from the mob than from Burgundy, fled the capital. The only person willing to take charge of the situation was Queen Isabeau, but she needed allies. Isabeau recruited to her cause Jean de Montague, a powerful member of the royal administration who served as Grand Master of the royal household and was a marmoset, and John V, the young Duke of Brittany. Now as a former marmoset, Jean de Montague needed no special reason to dislike the Burgundian party, even if John was still occasionally waving the flag of reform. But it should be noted that John's program of reform was quite different to the marmoset program and in many ways was the opposite of it. However, when we last left Brittany, the duchy was aligned with Burgundy. So what happened? 
Philip the Bold had briefly served as John V's regent before he reached the age of majority, and even after that had ensured that the Breton government would be full of men loyal to Burgundy. But after Philip's death, the Duke of Brittany worked to remove those men and ensure Breton independence of action. Still, though, this doesn't indicate a break between Brittany and Burgundy, and John V's younger brother Arthur even escorted Philip's body in his funeral procession to Dijon. It was actually John the Fearless rather than John V who broke the alliance between Brittany and Burgundy. In 1406, John the Fearless married his daughter Isabel to Olivier, the Count of Pontieve, and thus the grandson of both Charles of Blois and Olivier de Clisson. While the Pontieve and Montfort factions had officially been reconciled a decade earlier, John of Montfort now worried that if the Pontieves were to press their claim to the ducal throne, he could no longer count on Burgundian support, and worse, that Burgundian support might tip the scales in favor of the Pontieves. So in order to counter Burgundy, John of Montfort turned to the one man more dedicated than anyone else to countering Burgundy, Louis of Orléans. Shortly after the Burgundian Pontiev wedding took place, John of Montfort signed an agreement with the Duke of Orléans and arranged a marriage between his sister and a son of the Count of Armagnac, another important ally of the Duke of Orléans. John V also had his own marriage connection to the Queen, as he was married to a royal princess. So when the Duke of Brittany heard of the assassination of the Duke of Orléans, he was outraged, and unlike the Dukes of Berry and Anjou, was willing to confront John the Fearless. And when the Queen heard that Burgundy was planning to return to Paris, she summoned Brittany to the capital to stand against him. Montfort assembled a small army and made his way to Paris, arriving in the capital days before John the Fearless left Artois. John the Fearless arrived in the Ile de France with a small army of his own. He was met by the Dukes of Anjou, Berry, and Brittany, who told him that he could only enter the capital with a smaller force, but John ignored their entreaties, and on February 28, 1408, the Duke of Burgundy was back in Paris. John's entrance into Paris was triumphant and really demonstrated his dominance at the moment. He was accompanied by over a thousand men and had with him a whole host of allies. When he marched through the streets from the gate of Saint-Denis to the Hôtel d'Artois, he was cheered by the people of Paris. But once installed in Paris, the tension of the situation was apparent. The Hôtel d'Artois became a virtual fortress and Burgundian soldiers controlled the area around it. Chains were strung up throughout the city to limit movement, like the barricades that dominated Parisian revolutions four centuries later. So when John the Fearless and Jean Petit presented the official justification of the Duke of Burgundy to a royal assembly at the Hôtel Saint-Paul on March 8th, they did so to a somewhat hostile audience. The queen did not attend, and the king was still mad, so the young Dauphin presided over the assembly. The Dukes of Anjou, Berry, and Brittany were in attendance, but they made their discomfort and displeasure known. When the Duke of Burgundy greeted the Duke of Brittany, he responded that he was, quote, here to serve the king, not you. And so Jean Petit began his monologue. It is said to have lasted over four hours, and if you care to read it, it is recorded in the Chronicles of Enguerrand de Monstrelet. Richard Vaughan called it, quote, one of the most insolent pieces of political chicanery and theological casuistry in all of history, and Johann Heisinger called it, quote, a real masterpiece of political wickedness, built up with perfect art and in a severe style. But regardless, it does remain an interesting example of late medieval jurisprudence. The gist of Petit's argument was built on a syllogism made up of a major thesis, a minor thesis, and a conclusion. The major thesis was that, quote, it is permissible and meritorious to kill a tyrant. Jean Petit presented eight claims to justify this point, and the last claim was itself justified with twelve examples from the Church Fathers, the Bible, civil law, and philosophers in honor of the Twelve Apostles. And importantly to the minor thesis, which we will get to shortly, he also built a connection between covetousness and treason with tyranny. Once the major thesis had been proven, at least convincingly enough from Burgundy and Petit's point of view, the theologian moved to the minor thesis that, quote, the Duke of Orléans was a tyrant. To defend this claim, Petit dug deep into the now years-long tradition of Burgundian anti-Orléanist propaganda. From the Bible, Petit found the verse, quote, covetousness is the root of all evil, most famously for today being commonly translated as money is the root of all evil. Petit then claimed that, quote, 
The late Duke of Orléans was devoured with covetousness of vain honors and worldly riches, and that, to obtain for himself and his family the most high and noble kingdom and crown of France, by depriving our king of them, he studied all sorts of sorcery and witchcraft, and practiced various means of destroying the person of the king. From there, Petit went on to again stress the connection between the Duke of Orléans' ambitions and the accusation of his disloyalty to the king and his tyranny when in control of the royal council. Petit then listed the crimes of the Duke of Orléans. Orléans was accused of using black magic to induce the king's madness and plotted to slowly kill him through the same magic. When the magic proved too slow, the Duke of Orléans was also said to have plotted to poison the king with a poison apple, a la the evil queen from Snow White. Furthermore, Petit claims that the death of the Dauphin Charles was caused by one of those same poison apples. Petit then recalled the Ball des Ardents, when the Duke of Orléans accidentally set a number of nobles ablaze and claimed that the Inferno was actually another plot to kill the king. Orléans was accused of plotting treason with his father-in-law, the Duke of Milan, and with Henry Bolingbroke, saying that Henry and Louis had plotted together to usurp the thrones of both England and France. Orléans' support of the Avignon papacy was reframed as an attempt to get papal approval for a potential coup or to get the Pope to declare Charles and his children unfit to rule. The kidnapping of the Dauphin was also brought up again as a plot for Louis to gain control of the Dauphin and the Queen. And notably absent from these accusations was that Louis seduced the Queen, which in my mind gives further doubt to the fact that there was an affair between Louis and Isabeau. Orléans was said to have posted troops in garrison castles to facilitate his taking of the kingdom, a claim which shouts hypocrisy coming from the Burgundian camp. And last, but certainly not least, Orléans' imposition of heavy taxes was brought up again, with the fact that while they may have been officially meant for use against England, most of them were funneled into Orléans' pockets, with the claim that these taxes were being put to use to fund an Orléanist coup added. So with the major thesis and the minor thesis established and proven through scripture, law, and the course of events, and I use proven here with a pinch of salt, the conclusion that the murder of the Duke of Orléans was a good deed, and John the Fearless was right to do it, followed naturally. When all was said and done, Jean Petit asked John the Fearless if he approved of all he had said in the Duke's name, to which John replied, I approve. The next day, the Duke of Burgundy went to ask the king, who had briefly recovered his sanity, for a royal pardon, not as an act of penance and regret, but as one of justified indignance and pride. The Burgundian version of events, outlined above, was read out to the king, and while Charles was technically sane again, he was weak-minded and his memory was beyond foggy. The king gave the Duke of Burgundy his pardon, and thus granted royal assent to the justification. The royal counselors were then forced to fall in line behind the king, no doubt doing so unwillingly. But a few days later, when the king once more lost his faculties, the queen decided to flee the capital with the Dauphin unsure of the extent of Burgundy's ambitions. Learning from the last time she fled from the Duke of Burgundy, this time the Queen and the royal children were escorted to Milan by a large Breton contingent. Soon after the Queen arrived in Milan, she was joined by the Dukes of Anjou and Berry and Jean de Montague. But with the King once more insane, the most important princes, the Queen and the Dauphin out of Paris, and the royal council still opposed to Burgundy, John found that while he was the master of Paris, there was little he could actually do. The flow of revenue into Burgundian coffers was no higher in this period than it had been when the Duke of Orléans was alive, and the Burgundian program of reform still stalled. John was able to secure the occasional dismissal, such as the Admiral of France, a staunch Orléanist who pursued John out of Paris after his initial confession, and whose attacks on English shipping off the Flemish coast had interfered with Anglo-Flemish trade negotiations, and the occasional appointment, such as securing a Burgundian the role of provost of Paris. But other than these relatively minor matters, not much got done. So by the beginning of summer 1408, John had become frustrated with the affairs of the capital and distracted by events in Liège. The Duke of Burgundy's brother-in-law, John of Bavaria, the Prince Bishop of Liège, was in danger of losing his role as head of that important low country principality. So despite not wanting to surrender control of the capital to his political enemies, John saw that he had no choice but to return to the low countries to ensure Burgundian and Bavarian dominance. 
Next time, we will follow John North to see him deal with the unruly people of Liège. Will John be able to crush the rebellion? And just as importantly, what will happen in Paris while he's gone? Thank you so much to my patrons. We have two new patrons, Nicolas Comte de Comare and Marc Comte de Merceau, and also to Christine Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot Kraft von Kravenstein, Anthony Comte de chateauneuf nuxois James Kraft von Temsa, Preston Comte de saint fargo and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.